So here I want to show you a simplified version of that device known as a Maxwell's wheel. So in this case I'm simplifying it by assuming the wheel is in the shape of a solid disk. And there's its axis of rotation. And then we'll imagine that there's a strap that passes around the rim of it and wraps around and around and around. So when we hold it here and allow the disc to fall, then it ends up falling with some acceleration and we have to figure out what that is. In fact, I'd also like you to figure out as it rolls and descends, or spins and descends if you prefer to say, what's the angular acceleration? Well, there's two ways that we could approach this problem. One, we could apply the law of conservation of energy. And I would suggest that you either look through your notes and find an example where we've already done that, I believe in the previous uh, set of lectures from Unit 4.1, we've gone through that derivation. So the second approach would be consider torque and force. In particular, the idea that net torque is I alpha and net force is MA. All right, let's use this approach to figure out what the linear acceleration and angular acceleration happen to be for the falling Maxwell's wheel. So first of all, let's identify all the forces that are acting. So here's a free body diagram. Regardless of where the forces are applied, if the falling disc can just be symbolized as a dot, I believe there are only two forces. Mg, the weight of the wheel, pulls it down, and then this strap that wraps around the disc has some tension in it. Now, look at the length of my vectors. I intentionally made the downward vector longer than the upward vector because I know this system is going to accelerate in the downward direction. And of course, the upward force is just the tension in the strap. So we can say the net force is equal to mg minus t, so ma equals mg minus t. And there's a bit of an issue here. We don't know the acceleration. We also don't know the tension. So there's only one equation for two unknowns. So the other equation is going to come from considering not just how much force, but where exactly the forces are applied. So we need to locate where the axis of rotation is for our system. So we'll say the disk rotates about its center of mass. So when I say the net torque is equal to I alpha, I really only need to consider the torque producing forces. And what I mean by that is mg, although it's a force that acts on this wheel, it's a force that's applied at the axis of rotation. So the lever arm that goes along with the force mg is equal to zero, which means mg doesn't produce any torque. The only force that produces any torque relative to this axis of rotation is the upward pull from the tension. Now, if I want to calculate torque, I need to know more than just the force. I need to know the lever arm associated with that force. So that tension is applied at the rim of the wheel, and lever arm is always a vector that points from the axis of rotation to the point where the force is applied. So my lever arm is a vector that points to the left. We'll call that R. In fact, in this case, I'll say R equals capital R, the radius of the falling disk. In calculating torque, I need to know force. I need to know lever arm. And I also need to know the angle between those two vectors. Well, the angle between the vectors in this case is 90 degrees. 
So I can substitute in place for net torque a force of tension multiplied by a lever arm equal to the radius of the disc multiplied by the sine of 90 degrees and that's equal to I alpha. Well, I for a solid disc is one half m r squared and alpha is the same thing as a over r. So if I divide both sides of this equation by r and it cancels here and it turns this r into an r squared but then that r squared will cancel that r squared so I have t times the sine of 90 which is 1 so I have t equals 1 half mass times acceleration so now I have two equations for my two unknowns and I'm just going to make a substitution so ma is equal to mg minus one-half ma. So I'll add a one-half ma to both sides of the equation and I get three-halves ma is equal to mg. I'll cancel out the m and a is then equal to two-thirds of g. So it falls with an acceleration that's less than free fall, right? Okay. And you might have seen that result before when you tried to use conservation of uh, energy. Here we used the concept of torque and force to get the same result.